So neither is Ruth, neither is Rebecca, neither is Rachel. But if I take out Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Joseph, and Moses, and Daniel, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If I take out those eight people of the listing of the 16, plus I take out the three of Abel, Enoch, and Noah, which are non-Jewish, non-Hebrew, then all of a sudden, that took out 11 people, right? Well, then you start adding up the people that are left. If I took out 11, then there's, of the 16 mentioned, I took out 11. Well, then, then that, I took out okay, three, first of all. That means there's eight, there's, the, there's uh, excuse me, 13 left. I took out Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Joseph, Moses, David, and Daniel. That's, that's eight more. So now I'm down to eight people left, right? So, uh, eight more, excuse me, five people left, if I did that correctly. Let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Yeah, so I'm down to five people left. So there's five, there's five that are left. So if I take out these, these 11 people, there's five left. But then all of a sudden I start adding back all the prophets. So I, the people he did mention, Gideon, Bar Barak, Sam Samson, J Japheth, then you have Samuel, then, then you got to start adding back, then you add all the prophets of the Bible, all the books of the Bible. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Ob Ob Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Then you add the other books of the Bible, Nehemiah, Ezra, and who wrote them? Solomon and Esther. What a coincidence. I got 24. Give me a break. Really? So if I, if I take out the people that represented Christ as a typology, which is Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Joseph, Moses, and David, and Daniel, if I take all them out, I got, tw I got five people left. If I also take out Ab Abel, Enoch, and Noah, I got five left. But the five left, if I add on top of that all the prophets and the other people who wrote the books of the Bible, Nehemiah, Ezra, and, and Esther, and Solomon, if I, if, I wrote, if I put those in there, I got 24. I got 24. So I, I think that what I'm pointing out is I think these 24 people represent the wife of God, the Father, and the other ones who are direct typology of Jesus or who have, or again, who have a different um, earmark on them of what God did in their life, they are seen as different people. Uh, and you also can see them as not just the wife of God, the Father, but those who excel to the higher level of being part of the bride of Christ because they were imputed this through their relationship with God. Then also you have, well, wait a minute. What about the friend of the bridegroom? <clears throat> again, you got John, only three people in the Bible are called a friend of God, and that's John the Baptist, and that's in John 3, 29, Abraham in James 2, 23, and then Moses in Exodus 33, 11. So the three people are called a friend of God. So those three people are unique, right? They're different. So I just think it's interesting how, I don't know if that's true or not, that are the 24 elders representative of these 24 people of the Old Testament I just mentioned? Gideon, I can count them again, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Japheth, Samuel, that's five. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Joel, that's five more, that's ten. Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, that's fifteen. Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, that's twenty. Nehemiah, Ezra, Solomon, and Esther, that's twenty-four. The only person I left out of that in the book of the Bible is Ruth. <clears throat> and why, why leave Ruth out? Who wrote who the book of the Bible written about her? Why is she left out? Be because I think she's a type of the bride. So I, I would include Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Joseph, Moses, David, Daniel, because God mentioned them separately as uniquely in wisdom and how God mentioned them in righteousness. And then Ruth, Elijah, and Elisha, those are unique people that I think are part of that bride of Christ of the Old Testament saints. Those are earmarked differently. And by the way, and coincidentally, there's 13 of them, which I find, again, ridiculously, that, that <laughs> it's another... Coincidence? I don't think so. You have another thing here where you have 13, where God, again, you have 12 apostles, and you have one added in Apostle Paul, right? You placed Judas. And so you, you, you just kind of see these. And then, but these four that are non-Jewish are also interesting to me, Abel, Enoch, Noah, and then Job not mentioned. But if you count him, there's three that are known in Hebrews 11, and one that's not said. And four is the number of God's kingdom. Four is God's number for his kingdom. So I think that these, my whole point of all this is not to confuse the money of the waters. I'm going to list that on the board. I promise I will. So what I'm saying to you, what I'm saying is, is that of the Old Testament saints, 
Some are constituted to be a part of the bride of Christ because of their faith in the Messiah and how God used them in typology and a strength of how they represent that faithful one status. But the big swath of them are going to be constituted as the wife of God, and they're already, they're already preordained to have 24 of these seats the 24 elders sit in. But they don't relinquish those seats to the end of the Messianic reign, which makes sense, because that's only when the wife of God is revealed. She's revealed at the end of the Messianic reign until the day of the God, day of God. So it makes sense 24 elders relinquish those seats. Why am I saying 24 elders aren't the bride of Christ? Because the bride of Christ, in Revelation 3.21, she's an overcomer that sits with the Son, with God the Son, Jesus, on his throne, not their own thrones. So you're like, ooh, that's interesting. So if they're on his throne, then who are the other ones on these elders' thrones? That would only make sense. The second, only second tier people that would be even in view, that that number would be the wife of God. Then you start looking at why did God list people out Hebrews 11 like he did. And I start doing the math on this. You see the books of the Bible, who wrote them. You just got to figure, I'm just starting to do the math. I'm going to do it on the board. But again, I see there's of the people mentioned in Hebrews 11, and there's, again, there's 15 of them. No, excuse me, 11 of them. 11 of them that I believe are not part of the wife of God. That they're part of the actual pride of Christ because of their uniqueness and the role that they played meaning Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abram, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Joseph, Moses, David, Daniel. I believe those those 11 are unique from the list of 16 that aren't a part of the wife of God. They got a higher station given to them because of the uniqueness how God touched moved in their lives and used them as a symbolism of himself of the father and the son. So and so the 24 elders are angels. Yes. They're angels right now. So the apostles are on these thrones ruling with these angelic hosts in the heavens. And then at the end of the Messianic reign, they all give up their Stephanos back to, 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 to Jesus over to God, the, or, or to, to, to God the Father, excuse me, to God the Father. And he then, which makes sense why they do that, because also it makes sense, he's the one giving now these, these, these crowns out to his wife. Those who are 12 of them from the Messianic reign or overcomers from the Messianic reign. So of the, of the 36 elders that comprise the wife of God the Father, 24 are already spoken for from the Old Testament, and 12 are left open for those in the Messianic reign to attain to that based on what they live during that time period under the rulership of the Messiah. So with that being said, that answers kind of Pam's question about the 24 elders, do they stay? Those angels don't stay there. They leave because now there's no longer a need for them there because they were there to oversee Again, like our guardian angels, these are chief angels overseeing these, the, these stations for these people. And, and those 24 elders are then supplanted by the 24 Old Testament saints that have already been procuring those stations. And then you got the other 12 are going to be procured by people during the Messianic reign, yeah. which speaks to why there's a grouping of split between 24 and 12. Well, it's like yes. each of the apostles gets to pick one person. Right. They get, right. From each tribe. So yeah. each tribe will have one person represented in those 12 seats that are open. There's 24 seats already taken. And then the other people in the Old Testament, they, get, they, did, they, they got people like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and, and Sarah and, and all these people that they have, they have a higher station of the bride of Christ because even though they weren't in Christ, they're imputed this because of their uniqueness of their typology and how God used them to represent the father-son relationship because he did. And the it's bride. like those from the, the days of the prophet get to pick their counterparts from the days that he's king. Right. Yeah. And their counterparts. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. So, so the biggest the biggest takeaway for me was I used to think 24 elders was the bride of Christ symbolism, but then it didn't dawn on me until Revelation 3:21 exits that view out of your mind because it says the overcomer will sit on his throne, not their own thrones. That was the first sign of, wait a minute, i got to adjust my thinking here. Second thing is, who then can be the second tier group in his throne room that earns such a high privilege? Well, there's only other, one other station that's that high. That's the wife of God the Father. That would make total sense to me, how the, the bride of Christ is over here, higher level than the wife of God the Father. I, I, I get it now. And that's how that, that falls in. And then, then it also falls into the third thing, which was when Jesus said in Matthew 19, 28, tell apostles to be on 12 thrones. And I started thinking what Vicky said. Are they on the earth? But there's, no, there's only one throne on the earth that Jesus is on. So why is there other thrones? And I thought, well, then they're, they're in heaven. Why are they in heaven? Like, oh, that's right, because they don't have to traverse to and from. Their work on earth is done. Our work is not done because we're still producing the hunter fruit that we need for the second sperma. They already have all of it done. They've done it all, purposed and evidenced by the fact their name's already etched on the Holy City's foundation. There's no other work to do for them. They, they've done it all. They've earned the right to stay there forever. So, 
In other words, God already gave him that, that privilege. But they're on these thrones judging other people in, in, of the Israelites on the thousand year reign who are propagating through the 144,000 left behind. They're going to pick, like the Sister Lancy said, one apostle is going to pick one from this tribe, one from that tribe. And of those 12, 12 tribes represent the last 12 thrones. And then those 36 composite will be the wife of God, who will be the guest in the marriage feast of the Lamb, of the, of the bride, who is going to be on his throne. And those are different. But some of the Old Testament saints we mentioned will make it into that station as Abraham, Isaac, and so on mentioned. Well, you know, it's interesting because the 12 apostles were under the Aaronic priesthood, and the 12 they pick are also under the Aaronic priesthood. Right. Right. And I, yeah, and I also want to think it's important to note that the friend of the bridegroom, I believe, is, is commensurate with these four living ones because they are uniquely different. They're not so much, they're not, to John the Baptist mentioned, he was the friend of the bridegroom. So you have the friend of the bridegroom, you have the bride, the bride of Christ, the wife of God, the Father, and the friend of the bridegroom. So is, it, is, this, is this why it would make sense, Jesus said, the overcomer, the bride, will sit on his throne, Revelation 3.21. These, 12, these, these thrones of the, the, the elders, they're in the, whole, they're in the throne room, but they have their own thrones. So that's different. But then you have another group of angels in the throne room of the, of, that are not, the seraphim are there singing praises. Those are, those are unique people. But the four living ones, they are praising God the Son, and they transition to then also giving thanks to God the Father, and they give thanks to, and they say amen. So are they a word picture to those who are like friends of the bridegroom? I don't know, but if that's true, then there's one more missing. Because I only know three that I could think of, the friends of the bridegroom mentioned, John the Baptist, Moses, and Abraham. As, is there a fourth one I'm not remembering? I, I don't, it is, I don't know, is Job in there? I, I don't, I, but I think that there's one more missing somewhere. I'm, not, I'm, I'm missing it, I'm not getting it. But I think there's a fourth one, I do. I think there's only four people that comprise that friend of the bridegroom, and this is three of them. Because they're all named that way. They're all said, they're all friends. And by the way, the word friend for, um, in the Greek is philos, which means a, a dearly beloved friend. And then you have the word in Rea in Hebrew, it means a companion, a close companion. So Moses was a Rea close companion, and then Abram is described as John the Baptist as a beloved friend. So dearly beloved friend. So you have a different, so I think John the Baptist, Moses, and Aaron, there has to be Moses and, uh, and, 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 and Abraham. There has to be a, a fourth one. I don't know if I'm missing it. Who is it? I was thinking about that. See, I was thinking about that. Because he wasn't called a friend, but he has to fit in somewhere. Is that him? I, I, that, that could be really interesting. So I don't, but, and then, so I think it has to be a fourth one, and it could be him. I thought about that, because he's not mentioned in the Hall of Faith, but he has to be, he's a key, he's a real person. You don't think he's, so he has to be, he's a pivotal figure God used with Abraham, no doubt about it, before he became Abraham. So maybe he is the fourth one, because he is a type of Christ. They talk about him as a king priest. And he precedes the other three. Yeah, he precedes, he, that's right, he does. He precedes all of them. I was gonna say, not Abraham, that's right, he does. So maybe it is Melchizedek. Maybe he's, the, maybe he's the fourth one. So, but that being said, I'm going to write on the, well, Abel's part of, no, he's part of a different, he wasn't called a friend of God. Abel's, Abel's more of a type of Christ directly um, as the one who gets sacrificed by his brother in the open field, being that he was sinless. So, But yeah, Nancy was talking about um, Melchizedek being the fourth one as a friend of God, potentially. And I, I, can, I can see that but I'm trying to look for the actual verbiage where it says he is a friend of God. I only know of four, three people that are called that. And it's John the Baptist, Abraham, and Moses. There's no one else I could think of or, or read about who was called a friend of God. So, with that being said, let, let's close and pray. We went a little bit over, obviously, again. I keep doing this. But we'll start on next week, on next Sunday. We'll do chapters 6 and 7 review and questions on that and concluding anything we didn't answer from chapters 1 through 5 so far. Okay. With that being said, let's uh, let's stop and pray, and we'll uh, move forward today. Father, thank you for this time, opportunity we had today to again learn from you and hear from you, and continue to understand more about what you have to say for us and to us about your word. Thank you for helping us be mindful and diligent to pursue and to hold tightly to you. Thank you for all that you do for us. Help us again to uh, to get through life struggles and challenges and the the pains and the trials that Satan wants to put on us and our flesh wants to tear us away from our thoughts and our, our spirit being fixed on you. Help us to strive, give us the energy and the stamina and the, the focus and discipline just to cling to you, strive with you, continue to push through hard times. And always thank you for restoring us and refreshing us in our spirit every day. So we thank you and what you do for us and have done and are yet to do for us. In Jesus, Yeshua's name we pray, amen.
Look at that, a lot of notes. I see a lot of notes. Two pages. Names. Get me a picture. Uh, what do you possibly want to 